In this video, we're going to look at Tolving's semantic long-term memory theory of memory. Now, you need to be able to describe what this is and examine the differences between the different stores within long-term memory. You need to be able to compare the explanations of memory by able to look at the similarities and differences between them and evaluate Tolving's explanation of long-term memory. Tolving's explanation of long-term memory is very similar, well, it's based on the ideology of the MSN, which is that semantic short-term and long-term memory are in fact three different stores. However, Tolving criticises the MSN, saying that its proposal for the long-term memory is too simplistic. And he argues that within the long-term memory, there are three different types of stores for memory. These are episodic memory, semantic memory, and procedural memory. Now, if we have a little look at what these are, but using the names as triggers, we know that procedural memories are the procedures for things, so knowing how to do things, such as skills for riding a bike. If we look at semantic memories, we will talk about general knowledge, so facts. And if we look at episodic memories, we're looking at episodes, so personal recollections of events within our life. Now, Tolving argues that our semantic memory is our memory for facts and knowledge, and that these memories will lose their association with particular events and only the knowledge will remain. So, for example, you know that Paris is the capital of France, but you don't know why you know this. You can't remember when you learned this, but you know that that's a memory that you have. Episodic memory is a personal memory of an event, so your last birthday party, for example. Now, this is type of an explicit memory, so you know that you had a birthday cake or you know that your mum bought you a bike. And these memories will include the details of the events, the context in which the event took place and emotions associated. So, you know, you had your party at the pub and you were really happy when you got your bike. Procedural memory is skillful memory, the memories of how you do things, how you ride a bike, how you drive a car. Now, these memories require a lot of practice and a lot of repetition. Now, these are implicit memories, which are memories of how we do things. So we might find these quite difficult to explain. So if you had to explain to somebody how you learned to balance to ride a bike, you might find that particularly difficult. If we look at the three stores in a little bit more detail, we would argue that semantic memory is like our mental encyclopedia because it stores our words and what words mean, rules, facts, meanings, concepts of anything. And the retrieval is possible without a learning or a cue. So, for example, like I said before, Paris is the capital of France. Now, you don't know, you don't need to know when or where or how you learned that. You just need to know that that's true. Now, there's no temporal link within these, so it can be recalled without reference to when it was learned, and the input can be fragmented, so put together. So, for example, you will have learned that Paris is the capital of France, and five years later you might have learned that France is part of Europe. But actually, when you put all these together, that's perfectly possible because they are semantic memories. And recall won't affect or change the memory, so it doesn't matter how many times I remember that Paris is the capital of France. It's not going to change, you know, I'm not going to recall it 20 times and then suddenly think Madrid is the capital of France. Episodic memory is our episode, so experiences or events that have happened with us, it happened to us within our lives. Now, this is often referred to as our mental diary. Now, this is linked to time and context, so how old you were, for example, or where you were at the time. Um, and the input for this is continuous, so you may be able to recall an entire experience in one go. So you might be able to talk through what happened on your 15th birthday from start to finish. Now, recall is dependent on a context cue. So often these memories come back to you when somebody says, oh, do you remember when? Or, for example, on your 16th birthday, you might find it easier to recall your 15th birthday. And these are susceptible for transformation. So these can be changed. So when you're discussing an episodic memory, maybe with a friend or, or with a parent, and they say, oh, do you remember that this happened? And even though you might not have remembered that, that might then be incorporated into your original memory so that next time you recall it, that becomes a part of your memory. And procedural memory, which as mentioned, is the memories of procedures and skills, how we do things. Now, these you will remember years and years after being uh, taught how to do them. So, for example, you are taught to tie your shoelaces and you can still do that 60 years later. The argument is you'll never forget how to ride a bike. And these are automatically retrieved. So, for example, every time you put your shoes on, you don't have to sit and consciously think, oh, my God, how do I tie my shoelaces? It just comes to you naturally and you know how to do it. And this is called an implicit memory because it's a memory of how we do things. Now, if you look at the uh, summary table on the board, it's just comparing a semantic memory and an episodic memory against each other. So the details on there are the details we've discussed as we've gone through. But it's good and, and good preparation for the exam to be able to be prepared to compare these if that's what the question asks you to do. Now, it's important that we think about case studies as evidence for different aspects of long-term memory and for the fact that they are able to do, for example, the argument from Tolving is, is that we may damage our episodic memory store, but our procedural memory store might be perfectly intact. Now, two examples that we've looked at for this are HM and Clive Waring. 
Now, for example, HM, the argument is that his procedural memory was still intact, even though his episodic memory was damaged when he was given a um, task where he had to learn how to draw a star. A star. Uh, and he did this over a series of trials. He got better each time, even though he couldn't actually remember doing the task the previous time. Now, the fact that he improved shows that he was getting better. So his procedural, his, his memory of how to do it was obviously intact. But his episodic memory wasn't because he couldn't remember the first time he'd learned it. Now, these case studies are proof or support of Tolving's theory of long term memory and should be used as a strength within an evaluation. Clive Waring had a, a brain infection that left him with a moment to moment memory. So he would forget things 30 seconds afterwards. So you'll all remember the famous YouTube clip I showed you where he saw his wife and acted like it was the first time he'd seen her in years when in fact she was with him five minutes before. Now, some of his procedural memories that he had before were still intact. So, for example, he was still able to play the piano, although he had no knowledge of remembering to play the piano or previously playing the piano. And this, again, is support for the fact that they are two separate long term memory stores. However, you must be careful when using case studies of brain damaged patients because they can also be a weakness. Don't forget that these are individualised cases and there may be other factors involved. For example, we looked at HM in a lot of detail, which is a different video on the channel. And we see that actually it's argued that HM's socioeconomic status and, and education as a child deeply impacted his ability to do different memory skills.